Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for tuning in to Health Talk. I'm Dr. Victor Politi, President and CEO of New Health. So as healthcare in America is changing, New Health is part of that change. This half-hour program will provide you with the essential information about our services and facilities that provide top quality care that fits into your lifestyle. New Health's roots go deep into Long Island's community. What began in 1935 as a 200-bed general hospital has now become part of a unique health organization with mul multiple centers of care and a commitment to deliver excellent, essential care to everyone at every stage of life. You already know us as Nassau County's premier level one trauma center. We have so much more to offer the community, including a full service, state of the art, New Health's center of care in Nassau University Medical Center, the A. Holly Patterson Extended Care Facility in Uniondale, and New Health's family health centers, the FQHCs, located throughout Long Island. Our improvements are making us a leading provider of primary and tertiary care services that rival the best in the country. So I want to thank you all for being here and listening this morning and appreciate you for tuning in to Health Talk. I'm Dr. Victor Politi from Nassau University Medical Center, a big building over on Hempstead Turnpike. And we provide a lot of services to the community and we really pride ourselves on the changes that have been going on in the last couple of years and how Nassau University Medical Center has really come to the surface as one of the most premier and full-service hospitals in Nassau County. Let's face it, in Nassau County, there's a lot of good choices, a lot of great health care systems out here. And Nassau County Medical Center, uh, Nassau University Medical Center, uh, plans on staying on top of all the latest technological changes and then keeping up with the other hospitals in the area. So today, we are really have a great guest, um, and we're going to talk about something that affects Long Island is affects all of us in some way, and it really is a major problem um, in, in Long Island today, and it's a problem of substance abuse, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, particularly in our younger adults uh, with this heroin epidemic uh, that's uh, ongoing and the things that are happening in our community. Mass University Medical Center has a, a level one trauma center. We receive a lot of ambulances, a lot of patients uh, that uh, call for help from 911. And we receive a lot of these overdose patients at our hospital, and unfortunately, a lot of them succumb to their addiction. Uh, we also have uh, services at the hospital. We have addiction medicine services. We have inpatient detox and inpatient rehabilitation services. And we're trying to provide full service to the community. Today, Mr. Zeisman, who is an expert in substance abuse, he's a subs substance abuse provider. He is with an excellent uh, organization called ACI in New York City. And he's also, and we're proud to say, a member of our board of directors at Nassau University Medical Center, who brings a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge to the board and to me and to the hospital, something that we're really grateful for the amount of time Warren spends for us at the hospital. So Warren, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about addiction medicine? Well, doc, Dr. Politi, thank you so much for having me on the show today. Uh, it, really uh, a big honor, and I'm um, happy to talk about this very important issue. Um, my name is Warren Zeisman. I'm the CEO of uh, ACI, Addiction Care Interventions. We're around uh, over 45 years, uh, actually the uh, oldest uh, private addiction treatment program in the country. Uh, I'm the third CEO in our 45-year history. And uh, for the last uh, approximately two years, I've been on the board over at NUMC, uh, which has been a, a wonderful experience. And, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of great things over there. Uh, one of the things that I think is, is really, you know, a pre pressing issue is the heroin issue that you brought up. Uh, we've been doing a lot of talking with uh, leaders uh, in the community, in the addiction field, families, school districts about this issue. There's really uh, been just a rampant problem here in Nassau County. And I'm happy to be on your show and talk about it with you today. Yeah. So, you know... We are really concerned about this, as is, I'm sure, everyone in Long Island, because everyone's been affected by this. And if you didn't, uh, personally, you know someone that's been involved in, in some sort of addiction, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or heroin. And heroin today is, is really affecting the children. Um, and we're seeing a lot of overdoses. We're seeing a lot of, of children succumbing to, to heroin. Well, Mr. Zeisman, how, how did this just start? How does this process even begin? So a lot of it's actually happening with young folks getting involved with starting uh, to use oxycodone. Oxycodone, is, as you know, is an opiate. Uh, a lot of them are taking the medication right out of their parents' medication cabinets. They're experimenting with it. And when they get hooked on opiates, they st after a while when they stop using it, they start having withdrawal symptoms. 
And those withdrawal symptoms, they could have flu-like symptoms. They feel intense pain, almost like their bones are shattering uh, under their skin. Very, very uncomfortable. So they try to get something to help them relieve it. When they turn to drug dealers, they find out dr drug dealers sell oxycodone for $25 a pill and heroin for $5 a bag. And so at that point, even though they may have never thought they would ever use heroin, they're using it to relieve that pain and that discomfort. Um, and we're seeing a lot of young folks from middle class and upper middle class communities uh, here in Long Island who are coming in addicted to heroin, in many cases IV drug users, uh, which is uh, you know very scary. And it's difficult for the families and the parents uh, because many of them have a you know a lot of a lot of uh, strong feelings towards heroin. It's very provocative, you know, to say that your child is a, a heroin addict. And uh, part of the work that we're doing with the families is also to help them, you know, uh, learn how to be good supports, you know, to their loved one. So the doctor prescribes uh, someone uh, OxyContin for a fractured arm or a leg, a, a true medical uh, need for the drug, and then you use it, you get better, and you have these medications in your drug box. And these kids get that, and they'll share them amongst their friends, and everyone will bring uh, you know, some of these drugs together, or have a party, they'll use them, but eventually it runs out. And when it runs out, then they have to find some other source. And because heroin is so available, it's, it's so cheap, um, these kids get it. Now, they don't have to start injecting it right away, the heroin, right? These, this is really strong stuff today. Yeah, so, I mean, what, what happens with heroin addicts is they, when they're addicted and they start having these withdrawal symptoms, uh, usually, typically, what they do is they'll start snorting it. Mm -hmm. um, what happens is, over time, they develop such a tolerance and the withdrawal symptoms become so intense, they're looking to relieve it as quickly as possible. And injecting is a quicker way of getting high mm -hmm. than snorting. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they turn to it. People usually don't say they want to be an intravenous user. They, they turn to it because they can relieve the symptoms quicker mm -hmm. than if they snorted. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the, the key things that, to look at is how to get, the, get your loved one, if they are struggling with a, a heroin problem or drug problem, into treatment services. And, you know, one of the things that's been great about the hospital is we're actually the only... Uh, inpatient uh, addiction treatment program in all of Nassau County. And, um, you know, I think that really positions us to be on the front lines of the war on drugs. And in terms of uh, addressing this issue, um, I think it's important that, you know, we take a look at what are some things that family members can do. And in, in terms of that, one of them is to start looking at some warning signs. Uh, some of the key warning signs for people who are, if, you, if your loved one is addicted to heroin, may be uh, in terms of children, they're not doing as well in school as, as they were before. Um, other things that you'll see is that uh, they may be spending excessive time in the bathroom, uh, much more time than they'd ever sp uh, spent before. Also, a loss of appetite. People who are addicted to heroin typically will desire, desire drugs before food. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, probably the biggest key is with your child or your loved one, if your gut is telling you there's something wrong, there's probably something wrong. And if any of those things are, are different signs or symptoms that a family member is ex experiencing, the sooner you can get them in for an assessment, the sooner you can get them help. And at, at NUMC, you guys have a wonderful detox unit and rehab unit that you just spoke about before. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if you're sh struggling, I suggest you give NUMC a call here in, the, in Nassau County. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is a very prevalent problem out there. And, all, you know, talk to your kids, and uh, they'll tell you. They'll, they'll know someone that's using these drugs or have heard of someone's brother that's using these drugs. And, and we see the overdoses, and we're actually training uh, the police officers and the firefighters at our hospital in the use of Narcan. And Narcan is that intranasal spray that we spray into the overdose person's nose uh, that gets absorbed through the capillaries in the nose to, to combat uh, the uh, effects on the respiratory system from the heroin. Because when they overdose on heroin, they, they, their respirations start to slow and they eventually cease breathing. 
Um, and you know you can't live when you can't breathe. And so this Narcan competitively inhibits the, uh, the heroin in the brain, the opiates in the brain uh, at that uh, breathing center to allow that person to breathe. So it's life-saving. And, you know, at National University Medical Center, uh, we're continually giving these training classes for Narcan uh, for, uh, for people to have this uh, Narcan in their possession for families that have Narcan, uh, drug abuse. So that's one thing we're trying to do. So, so yeah, so it, that's a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. Narcan saves lives. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really fantastic. One of the things that we're, we're also seeing a lot in terms of treating folks who are addicted to opiates that's been really effective is the use of Suboxone. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're utilizing that over at ACI in our outpatient program. Uh, we have a lot of folks who are coming in from Long Island in the city because we're one of the few programs that accept insurance uh, for this service. We're right by Penn Station. Mm -hmm. And uh, Suboxone is an, is an opiate and it has an opiate blocker in it, which blocks 86 of the 88 receptors in the brain. And so within 24 hours, people are not experiencing any withdrawal symptoms, and they're able to be in a position to win when it comes to counseling. So let me explain that a little bit. Yeah, please. Um, folks come in, they're addicted to drugs, and one of the things that's most effective in terms of treating drug and alcohol addiction is counseling services. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody is having a hard time staying clean, they're continually relapsing or what we call chronic relapsing. They're very unlikely to succeed in counseling services while intoxicated or if they're, you know, getting high every couple of weeks. So by being on Suboxone, it puts that individual in a position to win. Because when they're on Suboxone, they can't get high on opiates at all. And they lose significant desires to use drugs. And so what it allows them to do is really benefit from the individual counseling, the family counseling, and group counseling that we provide. We've had tremendous success. In fact, our success rates with people addicted to opiates is 80% of the patients who come into our program stop using uh, opiates. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so it's, it's really been really a, a, a fantastic program that we started with Suboxone, mm -hmm. um, and it's very helpful for treating opiates, specifically among young people, because if they have parents who are actively involved in their treatment, they can monitor the medication, make sure that they take it every day, and taking the Suboxone every day really puts, uh, a, you know, a young person in a very good position to win and stay clean from alcohol and drugs for an extended period of time. So you're taking away the urge, you're satisfying the other urge, you're, you're quelling the, uh, the withdrawal symptoms, and now that child is able to sit in a counseling session with some of the counselors and get to the root of the problem and to realize, uh, you know, that this is not the way to go. Uh, it's uh, amazing. Is, is this like a methadone? Is, is, Suboxone is a pill, and you take it once a day. Um, now, methadone is something different, correct? Yeah, so they, they, work, they work differently, as you know. Uh, methadone, a lot of people, because they're both opiates, will mm -hmm. associate them as the same. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, methadone works because it's a stronger opiate than heroin, mm -hmm. and so when you're on a stronger opiate, you can't get high off of a weaker opiate. Mm -hmm. But you get euphoric from a methadone. Mm -hmm. Suboxone, you don't experience any euphoria. Mm -hmm. So the person is not, is not experiencing any high from it, and they're able to go back and function at work, usually within 24 hours. Um, their concentration comes back. Um, many, many parents who come and say, I have my child back. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I can't believe that happened so quick. I've been struggling with getting them treatment services for years. So the contrast between the two couldn't be more different um, while both of them are addiction medicine treatments. Mm -hmm. So Suboxone's the way to go. It's a pill. You can monitor it. People actually get their lives back. And then we sit them down with the counseling unit. Uh, per perfectly said. And we, we've had significantly more success with people taking Suboxone than we have with methadone. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the whole culture of, of the drug abuse today. It's affecting, you know, a lot of Long Islanders, uh, you know, a lot of communities. Uh, we're trying to get out to the schools, we're trying to get education out there. But even so, the kids still wind up getting getting their hands on these, on these opiates. So, you know, we need to get to the root of the problem. We need to get them clean. Um, overdose is horrible, um, you know, and it, no one wants to see their child addicted, but even more so, no one wants to see them succumb to this disease. So they need to get help. And so something like an ACI or a National University Medical Center that provides these services really should be on, on, on their first call. You should call us, 
tell us, this is the problem, get my son in there, my, get my daughter in there, let's get them clean. So the first step, I guess, would be the, to admit them, I guess, for to detox. So would I admit the person to NASA University Medical Center or to ACI, and they'll go through a detox protocol. Why, why don't you tell us a little about the detoxing? Okay, so there, there could be two. So if you, you have a loved one who's struggling, there could be two different options that, that uh, may be your first step. So if you have a person who's addicted to heroin, they're experiencing those withdrawal symptoms, the first thing is to get them a medically safe detox. So there's two different options for that. You have an inpatient option where a person goes into inpatient, uh, both at NASA University Medical Center and ACI, we have those services available. Mm -hmm. The person will be there usually somewhere between three to five days. Uh, they'll be put on a taper. What does that mean? It means that they're uh, taken down from the opiate using opiates till they're, till they're completely clean of all substances and then they can transition to the next level of care. In an outpatient setting, it usually will last you know, a little bit longer than the three to five days, uh, and the person will be in their home environment. So they're experiencing all the different life stressors that they, they're experiencing when they leave the inpatient unit. Um, if we use a medication like Suboxone, we may, we, there's many times where we'll start someone on a detox protocol where they may be uh, detoxing somewhere between seven to 14 days on an outpatient basis, and if they find that they need the Suboxone to stay clean, we can then convert it over to, to maintenance where someone will be on it maybe for three to six months while they develop the skills that they need to stay clean and sober uh, in an outpatient environment and then be taken off, uh, you know, before, you know, completing treatment of the Suboxone completely and be completely drug-free. Um, so those are two good, you know, starting options. The next step from there would be, from an inpatient setting, would be going to an inpatient rehab, a 28-day program, uh, just like the ones you've seen in the movies. We have one both at NUMC and at ACI, uh, both you know top-notch 28-day uh, programs, and that's more of a counseling-driven service where someone's in an inpatient setting, so they're living there uh, for 28 days, getting really intense, uh, you know, multiple hours a day of individual group counseling, family counseling. Uh, learning about their addiction and learning how to live alcohol and drug free mm -hmm. when they when they leave that inpatient setting. And then from there, folks will either go to an intensive outpatient program where they're going for uh, three hours a day, uh, three days a week, or they'll go to a residential setting um, where they may be there for anywhere between three to nine months of intensive residential. And the, the whole focus is have, helping people to live life on life's terms, alcohol and drug free, helping to make better decisions. And the way we do that is what we call relapse prevention. And there's a number of different skills that, they, that individuals learn to maintain uh, sobriety and, and uh, abstinence from alcohol and drugs on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that counseling is very beneficial for. Yeah, and that's key. And, and you said they, they become aware of, of the issues, they become aware of their own problems and the fact that they can't live their lives addicted to medication. And then they have to get back into, into their daily lives. Um, how about affecting, you know, the same friends or hanging out with the same crew? I mean, how do we handle something like that? I mean, what do we tell these, these patients, how, you know, to, to keep them away from those, those stresses? So it's, a, it's a key point, and you, you brought it up before when you talked about right. uh, heroin addiction within the, in the school districts and, and the kids are getting involved. And, and one of the things is, it's kind of like the thing that our parents always told us growing up. If I want to know what's going on with you, I look at your friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'll tell you, that tells you a lot about what's going on with your child. Right. So if your child's hanging out with a, a group that is experimenting, they're very likely to experiment, even with the best parenting. Mm -hmm. And so when you find that your, your child has a drug or alcohol problem, part of those changes may be also changing, changing the people that they're socializing with. Because mm -hmm. the likelihood that someone addicted to heroin isn't hanging out with other heroin addicts is very low. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one of the changes that we, we talk about both in, in our inpatient programs and our outpatient programs. And we work with young people in terms of developing strategies to be around people who are going to be more positive mm -hmm. uh, influences and help them to do, uh, get involved in more constructive activities that really will benefit their future. You know, at NUMC, we've been seeing a lot of patients uh, coming into the hospital that have been using a drug called K2, um, and they've been smoking K2, and uh, there are even some stories of using bath salts. Um, could you explain to us what, what K2 is and, and, you know, 
we see it out there. They're selling it in stores. What is that? So uh, it's a good point. So K2 is synthetic marijuana. Uh, it's currently legal to sell in, uh, in New York. Uh, there is some Department of Health uh, laws where they can issue violations. There are mm -hmm. nominal fees. There's been a lot done right now, I think, within the legis in New York State Legislature to try to make it illegal. Uh, I know the Attorney General just issued, uh, I think, some lawsuits yesterday mm -hmm. against uh, two, two uh, distributors of it here in, in New York. But it's become a huge gateway drug. It's actually the new gateway drug for a lot of our young people here in Long Island. Um, they're, they're turning to that before marijuana or alcohol. Why? It's legal for them to have. Um, they feel like they can't get arrested. Hmm. And one of the bad, big problems with it is it could be a lot more dangerous than marijuana in that they, there's a lot of chemicals in there because it's sold for potpourri or other, other purposes. And those chemicals can cause paranoia, hallucinations, uh, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. seizures, uh, even heart attack or death. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know there's been a lot of uh, emergency room visits related yes. to it. And it usually doesn't show up on the standard drug test. So a lot of ERs aren't testing for it. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, criminal justice entities, such as probation or parole, are also not testing for, for it. Um, it's something that we test for over at ACI. Uh, we're able to screen that out, and we've had a lot of young people specifically coming in who are addicted to K2, and because it's become the new gateway drug, it's kind of become a vehicle that, you know, gets them in, involved with harder drugs. Um, mm. So it's it's a scary thing affecting our community. So, I mean, you'll go into uh, one of these smoke shops or in these stores, and you'll see these, you know, nicely designed packages of synthetic marijuana of K2, and the kids smoke that? They put it in uh, rolling paper and smoke it like uh, marijuana or in a pipe and smoke it, that type of stuff? Exactly. I mean, the, the packaging of it is mm -hmm. really disturbing. I mean, right. one of the names of, of it is Scooby Snacks. Scooby Snacks. Clearly, clearly marketed to children. Right. And the labeling and packaging uh, of it it's, it is is all marketed towards kids, and it's as available as you're saying. It's in mm -hmm. bodegas. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing in the emergency room are these kids coming in psychotic. They're 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 aggressive. They're violent. They're, they're they really uh, you know have to be restrained by the uh, by the ambulance and the police officers and the fire department. They arrive, and then they come to us and they have seizures. Um, horrible seizures. You know, these are children with no history of having seizure disorders, or they'll wind up having, uh, in some of the worst cases, renal failure, and put, be put on dialysis for the, for the rest of their lives uh, from rhabdomyolysis. So these kids are having horrible outcomes from this stuff that they could buy in the in, in the bodega, in the stores, in the in the smoke shops. So something needs to be done, and I know uh, you know the lawmakers today are making you know are, are making that big push to stop to stop this stuff. Uh, what kids are getting their hands on. It's a gateway drug. It's legal. Um, as parents, what should we do? Should we look out for this? Should we, we have to educate our children to stay away from this stuff? Most parents don't even know it exists. Well, I think that's one of the main things. It's very similar to what we s said before about heroin addiction. As a parent, you know when there's something not right with your child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in, in all these scenarios where you see their, their school grades are suffering, uh, they're just acting erratic, especially with some of the behaviors with K2, like you said, the mm -hmm. hallucinations, delusions. These are things that right away you got to bring them in for services, mm -hmm. get them assessed. And there's really no harm in bringing somebody in for an assessment. You get to find out what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And it gives you, you know, direction of what you need to do as a parent. Right. So um, that would be the advice that I would give. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things that I think is important to know with K2 use, heroin addiction, and any real drug addiction, mm -hmm. is that 80% of people who abuse drugs have mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And 80% of people with mental health issues use drugs. And so one of the other key factors is that most people who are using drugs are doing it to self-medicate, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're young people or, or adults. So also psychiatric evaluations for people who are abusing drugs is really something that's a, a key component towards treatment. Uh, when eight out of ten people coming through the door have some kind of psychiatric issue if they're abusing drugs, if you don't get them on good psych meds, it's unlikely that they'll be able to stay clean because they're going to continue to have a, an is a mental health issue that they're right. looking for relief from. Right. So they go hand in hand, this dual diagnosis of, uh, you know, psychiatric disorders and, and drug abuse. They sort of feed off each other. And when we talk about psychiatric, we're not talking 
pure schizophrenia or delusional, but they may have anxiety issues. They may have some other issues that, um, that they feel relief by using these drugs, that relieves their psychiatric anxieties by taking these drugs. And so by, you know, going to a psychiatrist, going to psychological services, and discovering what those problems are, you may be able to help that child. You may be able to help, to help that person even more so than just plain drug treatment. That's an excellent point for families is yeah. when we're talking about mental health issues, it may, it may be exactly what you're saying, doctor, that uh, young people may have social anxiety issues, um, that they're self-medicating. It may not be what people think of when they think of mental health. Mm -hmm. It may be mild, mild depression, mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're looking for ways to self-medicate these, these uh, mental health issues, and they turn to drugs. So getting professional resources, such as a psychiatrist in place, mm -hmm. is a key component for that child stop, stopping to use drugs mm -hmm. and being in a position to succeed. Mm -hmm. Any correlation with some of the other, like children that have anorexia or children that have some you know, eating disorders, is there an association between that and drug abuse as well? The direct correlation with it, very similar, uh, utilizing drugs to self-medicate, mm -hmm. um, the eating disorders, right. uh, as right. well as, uh, you know, you see that with access to, dis access to mm -hmm. issues as well, personality right. disorders. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's not an easy answer, and they're not making it any easier by having these uh, this K2. Um, and what you said, it, these, this is potpourri. These are bath salts. That's how they're, they're being marketed and sold. Um, and then the, the word's out. You could smoke these things. You could you could eat these things and, and get high from them. You get a euphoria. Um, and the, these children, uh, these people are using this stuff. Um, so I also understand that uh, people who are on parole, you were mentioning that before. So people who are on parole for drug offenses are using this as well. Why, why is that? So people being monitored, whether it be parole, probation, task, they know that the court system's drug tests aren't as sophisticated mm -hmm. and aren't able to test for K2. Mm -hmm. And so what they're told is you can get high while you're on on. Uh, you know, probation or parole, and it won't come up on a drug test, which is really scary when you think about yeah, it. You have people sure. with severe and significant criminal justice backgrounds now abusing this drug that people hallucinate, right. get delusional, so you, you, amongst that population. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of these criminal justice entities have started using us as a resource, because right. we do test for it. We do test. And we're able to then, you know, report to them mm -hmm. if someone comes up positive. But one of the things I, w I would, you know, strongly advocate mm -hmm. and, I've, and I continue to strongly advocate for is that K2 testing is an essential part mm -hmm. of uh, testing in the criminal justice system, and it should be a requirement mm -hmm. uh, within, within all courts that they test for K2. Even in psychiatric illnesses. I mean, I have 160-somewhat psychiatric beds at my facility. I mean, how many of those patients present with these symptoms that might have been associated with K2? Oh, it's gotta be it's gotta be a huge number mm -hmm. so that we should really uh, look into that as well I mean that's a that's an important important one dr. Seisman thank you very much for that that's a, a good point so moving forward um, why can't they make this legal the, the, the chemical composition is easily changed uh, they keep having a problem with this yeah so most of it is made overseas mm -hmm. and the chemical composition is constantly changing so it's 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 hard to attach it to a specific law and legislation uh, now, what some of the folks are doing is it, government is uh, looking at the packaging, okay, making that illegal. They're looking at some of the uh, chemical mm -hmm. compositions. They're finding ways to eliminate the access, and I think that's really the key. Mm -hmm. If it's not as a, if it wasn't so accessible, okay, it would be harder for our young folks to be getting involved in using it. Um, so to cut off the access, cut off the bodegas who are able, to, who are selling this. Uh, creating fines where literally it would put them out of business to sell it, mm -hmm. I think is, is the key to cutting off access. And then having ways in, our, in the medical community to identify this problem, right. making testing of it much more available, and uh, providing you know counseling and treatment services, and, and also educating the uh, medical mm -hmm. and counseling community about it. A lot of people in the medical and uh, counseling community don't know a lot about the treatment of K2. Uh, that while they're learning a lot about how to identify it uh, because of, you know, an increased emergency room visits mm -hmm. and things like that. So coming, really identifying uh, different tr treatment methodologies such as cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, which has been really effective mm -hmm. in treating uh, folks who are addicted to K2. So, I mean, there's so many 
you know, raising kids today is so difficult to begin with, and, and with all these drug issues now and the availability of heroin and OxyContin, um, and now with things like K2, um, you know, we really have to be very aware of what's going on with, the, with our children today and, and even with our young adults, and most of them are out on their own, and, you know, they don't have the uh, parental guidance that, we, you know, they're not, you know, young anymore living at, in their house. They're away at college or they're out on their own in their own apartments. So it's so hard to keep an eye on everyone at all times. But I think having you on the show and, and just making it as a public awareness that this K2 exists. And if you see one of these packages in your kid's school bag or in his drawer, you know what that is. Google it. Look into it and investigate it. Uh, but it's not going away anytime soon, although everyone is doing their best. Um, at Nassau University Medical Center, um, we have that facility. We have the drug uh, you know, addiction medicine facilities. We have the inpatient detox, the inpatient rehab. Uh, the emergency department is, uh, uh, you know, sort of like our intake. Patients are being brought there all the time by ambulance for overdoses and other issues, either psychosis uh, related to K2 or other drugs. And once we get them, we test them. We can test them for the drugs. We can actually send out for the K2 drug as well. We can send it out and get it tested uh, if we need to. Um, and uh, we try to treat these, these people. Uh, but it is a major problem. So um, I want to thank you for being here, uh, Mr. Zeisman. I want to thank you very much for all you do for the community as far as uh, drug addiction, addiction medicine. I know you're out there. I know you're out speaking to, uh, you know, politicians and you're talking to uh, community groups and you're really trying to get the word and you're doing an amazing job. Um, and I know ACI, again, is a great facility and you do great work there, saving a lot of lives. Um, by you joining NUMIC and you being with us on the board and you bringing that experience to us um, and guiding us in a lot of ways, um, you're helping to bring NUMIC to a new level. You're actually helping us provide a care to the residents in Nassau County uh, at a higher level, um, and, uh, and the people should know that. And I thank you for being here with us today. Um, and to all you listening, I just want to say thank you. Um, enjoy your day today. I hope uh, we are able to give you some information uh, that might help you and your family. Um, and we'll see you again uh, next week. So, Warren, thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. I really appreciate you and uh, Chairman Morosnik giving me the opportunity. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. So, everyone, have a nice day. Thank you.